Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mark Moss Show. We're always talking about the decentralized revolution. We're talking about deglobalization. We're talking about the shift from a unipolar world to a multipolar world. You see it happening, but do you know what it means and do you know what to do? I want to make sure you stay one step ahead so you can maintain your wealth and most importantly, your freedom as all this goes down. Now, I want to run through some busy, busy, busy week, some late breaking news. I want to cover the latest Bitcoin news and there has been a lot happening globally. I want to talk about this new Pentagon study talking about this massive national security risk. I want to talk about the problem that California is having trying to transition EVs and what the rest of the world is looking at. We're going to look at the data that came out this week on inflation, CPI, things like that. Oh man, we have a lot to cover. You don't want to miss this. I'm going to try and talk through it fast and we'll see how far we can get through. But you know, like I said, the world is breaking apart. And what I love about this is that I'm just a fan for decentralization. I'm a fan for competition. I believe that competition always provides us with better products, better service, and better prices. It creates innovation. It creates progress. That's what competition does. If you just have a monopoly and you don't need to compete, then you don't need to provide good product, service, or prices. You don't need to reinvent. You don't have to do any of that. And so as the world sort of breaks apart, we have these different regions, we can see which ones work better. Nations could start to compete for us. They could start to say, hey, come here. We have no taxes. That sounds pretty good. Uh, hey, come here. We don't uh, make you inject things into your body or we give you more freedom or whatever it may be. And then we can see how that plays out next to an authoritarian state. And we're starting to see this play out uh, when it comes to the economic of things, partly because the monetary system is breaking down at the same way. And we saw this week that there are now four different nations, countries, sovereigns, that are now starting to mine Bitcoin. And they're doing this for strategic reasons. Specifically, they're doing it because of the ability of Bitcoin mining to help develop new sources of energy and to offset their losses or their costs and most importantly, to stabilize their energy grids. You hear a lot about, you know, the California grid, grid, grid going down. I mean, like every summer in California, we have blackouts going down. They can't keep the lights on. It's been happening in Texas. Um, and this is a big deal. It's all over the world. Um, in South Africa, they have blackouts for, I think, 12 hours a day. And they're working on moving those up to like 15 hours a day. So it's a big deal, like making sure that you have electricity when you need it, like, you know, when you turn the light switch on, it works, is important. It's also important if you're in a hospital. It's also important if you have a premature baby that needs to be in an incubator. You kind of need the electricity to stay on. And so we're seeing how Bitcoin is, a, is, is enabling these nations to do just that. We're seeing it happen in um, te Texas, for example. So um, just in the last two weeks, there was this massive heat wave in Texas, surprise, surprise, and a lot of people were going to go without power. And so Bitcoin miners were able to shut power off and divert that power back to the grid and whoo, save the day. And so we're starting to see the same thing. And, and part of the reason why is, like I said, they can further national interest in energy but also technological innovation and financial inclusion. So what do I mean by that? So, uh, well, first let's talk about these countries that are doing it. So the four countries are, uh, they're Middle East. Well, first of all is El Salvador. I've covered that one extensively. El Salvador was the first nation to make Bitcoin legal tender, meaning that it could be used as money anywhere in the country. You can go to Walmart or McDonald's or the gas station and use Bitcoin there. So El Salvador. Um, then we have Oman. We have the UAE, United Arab, Arab Emirates, and we have Bhutan. Now, these are Middle Eastern countries that all have energy. They have oil, right? But they want to pioneer these new forms of energy. They maybe want to use go to um, geothermal. They might want to go to nuclear and things like that. Now, what we can see is that a public-private partnership in El Salvador has committed $250 million of $1 billion to mining operations using renewables. Bhutan is more open about its operations after starting. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're going forth. Uh, we see in the UAE and Oman, they're turning to Bitcoin to stabilize their electricity grids and to monetize excess energy. And then also what they want to do is they want to lay a foundation for digitizing their economies. Um, in the UAE, for example, the amount of energy that's wasted is estimated to be worth over $500 million. So what does that mean? I want to break that down a second. So you think about, you hear from the New York Times or Washington Post, you know, some CIA mouthpiece, uh, you hear about Bitcoin is a waste of energy. You hear that? 
what does that mean? Who's to say what a waste is, right? So like, um, you may like to sit on the beach and stare out the ocean. And I say you're wasting your time. But for you, that's like meditation. And so that allows you to achieve a higher level of performance, for example. Um, so who's to say what a waste is? Well, one thing that we would say would be a waste would be is if we make something and then like we make a bunch of food, I cook a bunch of steak and then no one eats it, I have to throw it away. That's sort of a waste. I could have just saved the food for later. And wasted energy, Bitcoin isn't wasted energy. Bitcoin is using energy just like everybody else. Wasted energy, though, comes from power plants that make too much energy and nobody buys it, nobody uses it. So in the UAE, they have wasted energy, they have energy being created that's not being used, that's worth $500 million if it could be used. But who's gonna use it? They don't have enough people to plug in and use it. So what they can do is they can plug Bitcoin mining into that right now, and they can start to monetize that wasted energy. Then if you know the population grows or demands on energy grow even more than they have output for, they can just start to shut the Bitcoin mining off. And this is why it, it uh, positions countries, it positions nations, it positions states to monetize this excess energy. Uh, so for example, they want to pioneer a new nuclear reactor. Well, maybe they don't have enough people to buy that energy from that nuclear reactor right now. They might only have a little bit of demand for that. So they can't really afford to build that reactor because for the little bit of people that will buy today, it's not economically feasible. But what they could do is they could say, well, let's build a nuclear reactor today and 20% of that energy will go to, to people, to, to use, to businesses, whatever. But 80%, I mean, we, can, we can't run at those numbers of a loss. So what we'll do is take the 80% and put it into Bitcoin mining. But as the infrastructure grows, as more people move in the area, more businesses and things like that start to move in and use that energy, then Bitcoin can be shut off. And it's now allowed that new form of energy to be economically uh, installed into um, into a nation or into an area sort of like that. And so this is a real thing and it's happening really, really, really fast. And like I said, now there's four nations. Now I know you might be saying, but Mark, these are like small nations. Who cares about these? Well, the reason why we care is when, we, when we're looking at, well, anything for that matter, but really, you know, when I'm looking at uh, economic data, what I'm looking for is a couple of things. I'm looking for uh, one, I'm looking for like directionality, like what direction are we going and going from zero nations to one nation to now four nations shows me a pretty clear direction. Now we also have states doing it, like I said, Texas, et cetera. So that shows me a clear direction. What we also want to see is I like to show charts. Typically, if you watch my YouTube channel, by the way, uh, if you're not, you should uh, just search Mark Moss on YouTube. Um, I do a lot of, you know, obviously it's, it's video. So I do a lot of graphs and charts and things like that. And I like to show you the graphs and charts because I want you to see not just the direction, but I want you to see the, the speed of the move and the size of the move. And so while these might be small countries, the direction is there and the speed in which they're moving into it is happening pretty quickly. And these nations are also major energy um, producers, the UAE, they produce energy. So to see them going to this is a very strong signal for the rest of the world. Now, they also talk about wanting to go into this, you know, digital rail system. So potentially, you know, using Bitcoin as a currency, potentially using the Bitcoin network, like the Lightning Network, to use it as a rail to move their own currencies over. We don't know what the future holds for them. But in my opinion, it's very, very, very interesting. And back to the world breaking apart globalization, we'll get to see in real time how El Salvador, how the UAE, how these other countries, how their power grids hold up, how they're able to deploy and develop new forms of energy. And if it works really good there, then my hope would be that nations like the United States would come to their senses and go, oh, it's, it's working really well over there. We should probably do more of that over here. One thing that we are just witnessing this trend towards is something that's very alarming to me. And it apparently is very alarming to the Pentagon uh, because the Pentagon funded a study warning us of a massive problem with national security, a big national security threat. And that's something that you typically take pretty seriously, <laughs> uh, especially if you're the Pentagon, if you're in the military, like you take threats to national security pretty seriously. And in this case, what they warned us, what the study found out is that the big warning, the big risk to national security they found is dementia among U.S. officials. Now, I've talked about this. If you follow me on social media, you see me post about it. If you don't follow me on social media, uh, 
hit me up. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram, on Twitter, at one Mark Moss. Um, my website at onemarkmoss.com has everything linked there. Um, but I've posted some of this stuff before, and you know we've seen Diane Feinstein and Nancy Pelosi. Obviously, you know about uh, Biden. Uh, but recently, we've seen Senator Mitch McConnell. He's, he's a Republican from Kentucky, and look. I'm not trying to claim any label here. I'm going to go equally as hard on Biden, a Democrat, as I will on Mitch McConnell as a Republican. I don't care. I'm going to call it out as I see it. And we've seen twice now. I, I called it out the first time, and now it just happened a second time, where Senator Mitch McConnell basically was, like, giving a talk and, like, just froze. Just stopped talking and had to be come and grabbed and like escorted off now the first time that happened it was very alarming to me and most people that have any sort of a brain and can think about this thing um lots of comments i said i i, I saw were like oh you know he pooped his pants or uh like this is normal he just forgot what he said was gonna say i mean they're trying to like rationalize that but it's not how like healthy young people work like, this doesn't happen. Now, it might happen to some people. I just would argue that they're not healthy. Like, you don't just freeze up like that. But the bigger problem, as is, as is shown in this study, is that as the national security workforce is aging, they're seeing dementia is starting to impact these U.S. officials. And as I said, it poses a, a threat to national security. And so Mitch McConnell had this second episode, and he enjoys the most privileged access to classified information of anyone in Congress. So he has the highest level to the most classified information of anyone in Congress as a member of the so-called, what they call the Gang of Eight Congressional Leadership. 90-year-old Senator Dianne Feinstein, she's a Democrat on the other side of the aisle, she's 90 years old. You can see her decline all over. I mean, if you don't see this, you're completely blind or you just listen on the radio. But like, literally, she had disappeared for a long time. Everyone thought she was dead because she had no appearances. Then they show, they wheel her like half living corpse out into a wheelchair. And no, no offense. Like, I mean, if you're a family member, I'm sorry, but like, it's the truth. Like she's old, she's 90 years old. They wheel her out. Um, and then you see her in, in the halls of Congress and she doesn't even know what she's talking about. And they're telling her how to vote. She was like rambling on. They said, just, just say, I just say, I just say, she's like, I like, She's, she's uh, signed over all legal responsibility of her estate to, I believe, her daughter. Like, she doesn't even have control over her own estate, her own assets, her own person. But yet, she's one of the highest ranking members of the government? Like, how does that make sense? How is she able to vote when she's experiencing memory loss? When she doesn't even know where she's at. When she can't even recall that she was just gone for a month. And she was part of the Gang of Eight for, for years, and she remains a member of the Senate intelligence community. Why is she on the intelligence community? Nancy Pelosi. She's, uh, she's running again. She stunned observers when she announced that she wants to run again. She's 83 years old. And again, look, I don't have a problem with old people. I love old people. I love my grandparents. Um, but at some point, it seems like we have laws in the United States against elder abuse. And when you're rolling people in wheelchairs who don't even know where they're at, and you're forcing them to vote for things they don't even know what they're vote, voting for, at what point does that become, I don't know, I'm not an attorney, but elder abuse, uh, certainly manipulation of old people. Like if you got someone to, like and, and if you got somebody in that stage of life to, you know, give you power, power of attorney over certain assets or to transfer you a bunch of money or enter some sort of a contractual agreement with you, that would probably be deemed illegal or at least um, non-binding, right? You, they, don't, they, they clearly don't know where they're at and you took advantage of them. But yet that's exactly what we're doing here. And the thing that I don't understand is, look, I cited Republicans and Democrats. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. I don't understand how people, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, I don't see how anybody can be okay with this. How can anybody be okay with seeing Biden go to this 911 memorial and just start rambling about just random topics, talking in circles, on stage saying, uh, oh, my handlers told me not to do this, or like, I don't, he says, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, how can somebody be okay with that? 
And look, I get it. Like, you you know, you're for this radical left progressive, like whatever. Okay, that's yeah, cool. But like, couldn't you just get like a Gavin Newsom or something like that? Like, do you have to get people who can't talk, who don't know where they're at? And according to the uh, now, according to the uh, Pentagon, it's a threat to national security. Now, most holders of security clearances, which is, by the way, a very ballooning class of officials, um, have access to secret government information. They're subject to rigorous and invasive vetting procedures. So how can they hold that? I guess at some point, maybe it should be rescinded from them. Who knows what they're going to say? They're in with their nurse and they're just rambling like, you know, security clearance stuff. Now, in 1981, only 4% of Congress was over the age of 70. But by 2022, that number is almost 25%. So from 4 to 25%. And now keep in mind, the average age of a Fortune, fund, Fortune 500 CEO is 57. Average ages of Congress are in their 70s. Feinstein's 90. No one's running a Fortune 500 company at that age. Well... Maybe Warren Buffett. I'm not sure if he's still the active CEO or not. But the, av the average age of a Fortune 500 CEO is 57 years old. And I think it's time that we have that. I think everybody agrees to that. And we see this kind of coming back onto the ballot. This is like another talking point. Um, term limits, obviously, we have that. Insider trading is one that they just don't want to have happen. And now this age limit. But I would just, I would love to hear, hit me up on social media. Let me know. Am I wrong? Do you, do you have a different viewpoint? Uh, and this is an opinion, so I can't be wrong. It's my opinion. I'd like to hear your opinion if it's opposite of what I have. Why would you, regardless of what aisle you're on, think it's okay to vote for a Dianne Feinstein or a Joe Biden? If, if anybody has a counter opinion to that, I'd love to hear it because I'd love to hear opinions from both sides. Now, hit me up on social media at uh, one Mark Moss or shoot me an email. Now, you know, part of this trend that's sort of leading to this shift in the world is sort of this shift in power. When I say power, I mean more like energy, like electricity, but energy. And all throughout history, it was um, the nations that had the most natural resources were the ones that were the most wealthy. So if you had gold, if you had oil, right, things like that. What's interesting is that, you know, we're now moving to this world where the nations that have the oil, the West, the United States and Europe no longer want to use it anymore. Um, you know, it's sort of like the fish doesn't know it's in water sort of thing, where these people have no idea how the world works and don't realize that without oil, the whole world stops. We don't have cars and we don't have trucks and ships moving stuff around, which means we don't have anything. Um, but Mark, couldn't we just make batteries for you know, tankers moving containers across the ocean? Well, probably not in the next several decades. Um, but couldn't we just use EV vehicle? Like, I mean, come on. Like, even without oil, like, you don't have petrochemicals. So, like, how do you get tires and how do you get shoes and how do you get, like, cleaners and detergents and pesticides? But I don't want to talk about that. What we want to talk about is this new story that came out of a new study that came out that's really starting to change the narrative on this push to um, renewable energy or, like, Alex Epstein likes to call it unreliable energy, and specifically in regards to electric vehicles. And so an article came out this week, um, Robert Charette, a longtime systems engineer, a contributing editor to IEEE Spectrum, and he's the author of the EV Transition Explained. And in this article, he said that the viability of a speedy switch to, of the nation moving to electric vehicles is a uh, difficult conversation. He said it's a nuanced perhaps conversation. And he was basically saying that, you know, with the amount of uh, the push from governments to go to EV vehicles, with the amount of volume of EV, EV vehicles being sold today, um, the problem is, is how do we get them all charged? And there's a couple problems with that. Like obviously one, how do we get enough charging stations out there? One, how do we get this to be fast enough so people can actually do it? That's number two. But what has to happen order in order for that to happen? And this is where most people get lost. So you have to learn how to think past first order, second order, third order, fifth order, fifth order, sixth order, and on and on thinking. So for example, uh, well, all we need is just more EV charging stations. Okay, great. So what has to happen to have that? 
Um, well, we need more components for that. We need more regulators. We need more um, switches. We need more things like that. Okay, what else has to happen? Well, we need, uh, we need a better electrical grid. And that's the problem that we're seeing in California. In Palo Alto, California, for example, California is always the microcosm for the United States. They say what happens in California then goes to the rest of the nation. And so we can see in California being the first nation or country, sorry, if California was a nation, it would be, I think, the fourth or fifth largest nation in the world by GDP, but it's a state in the United States. Uh, but they have gone in one of the fastest, uh, most aggressive shifts away from what they call fossil fuel, including nuclear, to move to this renewable energy, which is why we continue to have blackouts all the time. It's also why we have the highest energy price in the nation. In the summer at peak power, we're paying over 40 cents per kilowatt hour, which I know, I know, it's shocking to you if you live anywhere else in the country. But on top of that, we also have one of the fastest adoption rates of electric vehicles in Palo Alto, which is, you know, Silicon Valley. We have the highest adoption rate of EV, EV vehicles in the country. One out of five households has one. It's about 30% of all new car sales. The city incentivizes people to do that, um, to get this 80% reduction in greenhouse gases um, by 2030. The problem is that in order to get there, the city's got a lot of headwinds. They have a lot of problems that they have to get over. The city's power grid shows massive signs of strain and it's starting to fall apart. Now they're trying to upgrade it, but the upgrades could take seven years and could cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So in California, during the summer, the last two years, we've been having rolling blackouts because we just don't have enough power, period. Now we have more load because of the electric vehicles. And now for the last two years, we've seen the state of California actually say, hey, we don't have enough electricity. Don't plug your EV in. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, you might have seen some of these uh, pictures of like a Toyota Prius pulling a little trailer with a generator. So now you get the generator running gas and it charges your car. I mean, is that what we're supposed to do? So how can this work? When we have peak loading times, everybody comes home at night, everyone needs to plug it in, and we don't have enough power for it. It's a big problem. So, you know, could this be fixed? Sure, certainly. Could we get more power to the grid? Certainly. We could build some more nuclear reactors. That only takes 25 years. No big deal, right? So can are these things um, insurmountable? Like, obviously not. But we need to put things in line into, into reality. When you listen to these politicians who are on the campaign trail already, you're going to hear them spouting things that are really nice, like, hey, we should all have a unicorn in our backyard that uh, poops Skittles for us. That'd be great. Everyone, everybody that wants what I'm going to give you one. But like, how? How are you going to get that? Like, it's not realistic. And so when you hear them say, we're going to get it, we're going to be 100% off of uh, fossil fuels, we're going to be 100% net, net, net zero, like, like, no, no, you're not. Like, it's, it's just not possible. So you have to understand this. And it's not, like I said, it's not insurmountable. It's not a problem that we can't get there. But how? How we get there? Now, a couple, a couple things. Think about this. An EV vehicle, electric vehicle in a home is equivalent to 25 refrigerators being plugged into your house. Now, add to the fact that in California, they want everything, all fossil fuels gone. So, for example, now... I think it's a statewide thing, certainly in many counties, you can't build new construction with natural gas anymore. You know, the, the natural, you know, the natural gas that comes out of the ground naturally. You can't, you can't run that anymore. You can use electricity now. So now all of the appliances in the home, dryers, uh, stoves, ovens, refrigerators, all of these things that would run on natural gas that we have naturally. As a matter of fact, the United States has so much natural gas <clears throat> that it's so cheap because we have so much of it that most of the natural gas isn't even captured. They just let it vent into the air or they burn it off because it's so cheap because we have so much of it. So we have this super cheap, super abundant source of energy that's natural and we can't use that. And now all of these appliances now have to go onto the electrical grid that we don't even have enough electricity for right now that's already having blackouts. Even in California, I'm trying to add on to my house. And as I met with architects, they said, well, we could add this onto your house, but you can't run gas over there. 
Like what? Like how does that even make sense? So not only do we want to push uh, EV vehicles on, we want to shut off our nuclear reactors. Our grids can't handle it. We want to now have everyone run EV vehicles. It's equivalent to 25 refrigerators. And now all the appliances also have to go into the grid. I don't know how that works. Snap your fingers, close your eyes, maybe you'll wake up in a fairy tale. We saw the Ford president um, tried to drive a, an EV F-150 across country. He was severely disappointed and noted that the country is not ready for an EV system yet. We saw the energy executive uh, secretary, Jennifer Granholm's EV road trip went bad. And it, in, in articles that covered it, they said uh, they found out that Americans don't need it. I think most Americans, as demonstrated by the Secretary's troubles on our road trip, understand that there is not a choice, that they need to have the choice of the kind of vehicles they want to buy for their lives. And unfortunately, that's not the choice that the federal government wants to provide for American families. As a matter of fact, this week saw the new CPI number release, the consumer price inflation. Now, you hear about uh, the central banks around the world, the Federal Reserve trying to stick to this 2% inflation target. They only want 2% inflation. Now, why 2%? Well, 2% is an arbitrary number. It was literally, uh, well, if you, tr if you trace back to the origins, where it came from, was at a press conference, the, I think, uh, finance minister of New Zealand was in a live conference, and they said, oh, we want to get inflation down to 1% or 2%. I'm sorry, he said below between 1% and 0%. And they said, so then, like, what's the highest it should be? And he said, oh, I don't know, and then call it 2%. And it was like an off-the-cuff remark in the 80s. Uh, the Federal Reserve adopted that number in the 90s, as, uh, as, as most other central banks have done. So that number is um, arbitrary. What isn't arbitrary is their mandates. So they're, they're legally obligated. Their, 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 their dual mandates are, one, stable prices, and two, full employment. So stable prices. So they've chosen to pick this 2% number to try to be stable there. However, prices are anything but stable. Now, the CPI number, consumer price inflation, measures that. It's, it's one way to do it. It's a consumer price index. And those numbers came out this, this uh, week, and we saw that consumer price index rose by 0.6% in August, which is its biggest monthly gain of the year. The inflation gauge went up to 3.7% from a year ago. So year over year inflation is up again. Now, I do want to point out, I make, make this point all the time, when inflation comes down, that doesn't mean prices come down. It means that the prices are still going up just at a slower rate than before. We also saw the core CPI, which is CPI, consumer price index, minus the things that you need in life, such as food and energy. And no, I'm not joking, that's serious. The core CPI increased by 0.3% and 4.3% uh, year over year. Now, the Fed really focuses more on the core inflation. They think that provides a better indication of where inflation is heading over the long term. So again, if we just take out the things that you need to live, like food and energy, that's a better viewpoint, which seems kind of weird to me, but that's what they do. Um, but what we can see is that it's energy that's really driven the prices. Right, So after the Russia-Ukraine war situation broke out, the Biden administration started shutting down oil, oil prices spiked crazy from like, I don't know, 80, 90 bucks to 150 bucks a barrel. They've come back down and coming back down to reality is what's brought that inflation number back down. But now they're going back up. Energy prices have been, you know, like I said, brought it down, but it's also what's pushing it back up. We can see it rose 5.6% on the month. An increase that included a 10.6% surge in gasoline. I don't know if you've seen it, but in California, gas prices are back. They're in the 550 range or even more, depending on where you're at. So food prices are going up, shelter prices are going up, but it's mostly in that energy sector, which pushes everything up because, as you know, energy drives everything. Now, the jump in headline inflation also hit worker paychecks. Real average hourly earnings declined. 0.5% for the month, right? When prices go up, your real hourly earnings go down. So even though you're still making whatever, you're 20 bucks an hour, it buys you less things. And so your purchasing power went down. And this is what people don't understand. Um, let's just make, work, I mean, let's just make everybody be able to live easier. So let's just raise their pay. Let's just uh, pay them more money. Let's pay them $30 an hour for minimum wage. But when you do that, 
then that 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 uh, business then has to charge more for their goods and services, which then pushes the price of everybody else. So even though those workers are making more money potentially, that more money will still buy them less goods and services. So even though on paper they went from whatever twenty to thirty bucks an hour, hoo hoo, uh, at the end of the day when they go to the grocery store they take home less goods. But the important thing that I want to dig into is here is I've been pretty vocal about this for well over a year, even when inflation was in the 7 8% range. I said that this would be some of the lowest inflation that we'll see for the rest of the year. I'm sorry, for the rest of the decade. This would be some of the lowest inflation we see for the rest of the decade. Now, you might say, well, Mark, you were obviously wrong because inflation came down. Inflation comes in waves, right? Nothing goes up or down in a straight line. There's never been an asset in the history of the world that does that. Everything goes up and down, ebbs and flows. And so inflation also comes in waves. And this is round two of the post-COVID price inflation wave. It went up like crazy. They were able to bring it back down. And now it's going to go back up again. Now, another index that we look at is called the PPI or the producer price index. And that just came out as well. And it's bad. Okay, PPI is up 0.7% in August, higher than the 0.4% estimate, almost double the estimate. That's not good. It's the biggest monthly gain since June of 2022. All right, that's a big deal. Core PPI rose 0.2%, which was in line with expectations. So that one's okay. We saw retail sales climbed higher than expected, 0.6% in August, uh, well above the 0.1% estimate. Now, CPI follows PPI, okay? Because the producers have to make it first before the consumers get it. Right? So PPI is more of a leading indicator. CPI is a lagging indicator. And uh, in case you wondered, both of them are horrible. Right? Um, they are both completely, uh, completely, you know, totally untied, untethered from reality. All right. Let's look back into some history to kind of see some of this. So we can see, uh, if we go back to 1974 to 1980, the last time that we had stagflation in two waves. Now, the second wave, of course, led to, led to massive amounts of inflation. And we also saw gold spiking. Gold went to $872 um, and silver went to $50 an ounce. But it was actually more mild when you read through the PPI. So PPI topped out in November 1974 and bottomed 23 months later in October 1976. From that point on, for the next three and a half years, we were headed into the most extreme gold and silver bull markets in modern history. The dollar was nearly destroyed. Now, it's important to understand at this point, we had just come off of the gold standard a couple of years earlier. And so people were able to go buy gold again in 1974. And so it started taking off like crazy. We also didn't have this, uh, you know, crazy stock market like we have today. We didn't have millions of equities to go into. Um, the average American wasn't investing into the stock market at the time. And so that was a lot of reasons why we saw gold and silver take off like it did. Uh, but at the time, the inflation was so strong and people were going, getting out of the dollar as fast as they could into anything else that it nearly destroyed the dollar. Um, and it was only Paul Volcker raising the Fed interest rates over 20% that seems to save it. All right. So if we look at today, we see the same thing. PPI has been in a year-over-year -year decline for 15 months. Not quite the 23 months we saw in the 70s, but, you know, history rhymes. It doesn't repeat. Um, retail sales should be falling if people are trying to save dollars. And to some extent, they are, right? We can see they're cutting spending. However, when counted in dollars rather than units of goods and services acquired, we, can, we, we see the difference. Now, what's probably happening is that people are buying less and less stuff for more and more money. In other words, retail spending is concentrated in more and more basic necessities showing up as increased spending when it's actually decreased spending in real terms. So they're not buying as many things. They're spending more dollars, but now they're just buying food as opposed to spend. So let's say you were spending a thousand dollars a month discretionary and you were buying, going on, uh, buying a bunch of things. Now you're still spending a thousand, but you're just buying food. So you've increased your spending, but you've decreased it in spending of real terms, if that makes sense. Now, uh, gold took off before and gold could certainly take off again. Um, it looks like it's poised for a breakout. Now, I've been working with a company called Universal Coin and Boyan. And I've been working with them because I trust them. The founder and CEO, Dr. Mike Fulgens, wrote the consumer alert on gold coins for the Texas Attorney General. And not only do I feel like I can trust them, 
they have great prices because we want both, right? And they have a very special offer for my listeners, Universal Coin and Boyon. You can get a special price on a silver one ounce American Eagle coin with no dealer markup for just $27 each with a limit of three. And you can even get free shipping. So if you want to take advantage of that deal, which I highly recommend, give them a call. Call Universal Coin and Boyon to get this $27 silver Eagle coin deal today. Plus, great prices on gold, silver, and lots of other things. Give them a call, 1-800-UCB-GOLD. Tell them Mark Moss sent you. Again, 1-800-UCB-GOLD, or go online to universalcoin.com slash Mark Moss. If you're just tuning in, you've been listening to The Mark Moss Show, running you through the decentralized revolution and the latest breaking news headlines of this week, so you stay up to date on what's going on. That's what we got for the show today. Thanks so much for listening. Hit me up on social media at one Mark Moss and let me know what topics you'd like me to cover so we'll get more of that on the next show. And that's what we got. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.